Jason, what you were talking about the market being down, that would be down 30, 35% in the third and fourth quarter. When we got, when I, when I had to jump off the call. And yeah. I was talking to you about the reasons why I felt it was going to be significantly worse than that. Yes. Uh, that, I don't see any way uh, that you, we have a, the, the third and fourth quarter are going to be extremely problematic to figure out um, where to buy and when to buy. And this really is the issue for me as to um, when I'm seeing investors begin to look at buying now, investors with limited amounts of capital need to be very careful about buying right now. Uh, I, do, I do have enormous confidence in the economy going forward. I think this time next year, next summer, it'll just be unbelievable how good the market will be. But, I mean, as I've said, the day they announce a vaccine that works, it'll be like uh, the end of World War II and the end of Prohibition combined. It'll be, I mean, it'll, it'll be a straight up recovery. But until then, I think it's very tepid, very hit and miss uh, in a recovery process. Okay. Do you see it? I mean, you're, you're plugged into the, the home builder side of everything what what are your thoughts i mean what what are people telling you um i think the underlying supply and demand fundamentals are, are there none of that's changed um there's a fun, there's a housing shortage and you know however a lot of this stuff shakes out um you're still going to have have needs for roofs over people's heads so um new units need to continue to be made you know i, I think uh, figuring out affordabilities and capacity to pay uh, is going to continue to be an issue. The NAHB seems to think that uh, the industry may lose some workers out of it. So labor constraint, and, and this is also coming for our organization as well, that labor constraints are going to be um, every bit as much of an issue moving forward as they have been, if not uh, a bigger deal. Um, you know, a lot of availability. These, these are all the stuff that were that was going on pre-coronavirus. So I think coming out of this, those are all still going to be there, and those are going to be the bottlenecks. But the underlying supply and demand fundamentals seem um, seem to be favorable for for growth. I mean, the question is who's going to pay for it, and where's the money coming from? Yeah, that, so there's the issue exactly, right? So you and I agree on the underlying fundamentals. The problem is I just see this giant bottleneck coming um, we've got um, we know that there's three million or more forbearance agreements now there were three million in the first week so uh, and the majority of those are in the Ginnie Mae pool of loans the FHA THDA HUD VA uh, and jumbo loans uh, they all fall into that same pool uh, the most of the forbearance agreements were with uh, specifically with FHA loans it, or so it appears right now so if you eliminate, so we know the investor market for the ability to refinance investor loans is non-existent. That will really begin to take its toll 60 or 90 days from now, coincidentally, when about the time the forbearance agreements are all getting ready to expire. So you've got investors who have got inventory that needs, they need to do something with, forbearance agreements which are coming due and people are gonna either have to extend in their forbearance or they're going to have to begin making payments. The jumbo loan market is impacted because it's in that same Ginnie Mae pool of, in, of um, mortgages, as I learned last night talking to Chris Burleson. So you've got the top end of the market, which will get jammed. The lower end of the market of buyers will get jammed. A lot of product coming online and investors not being able to refinance. There's just no scenario in that mix that makes for an active market. And the idea of demand plus availability of finance equals value, that equation is going to be completely out of sync because there, there's no question the government is going to make enormous amounts of money available. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could see mortgages at you could you could see mortgages at two and a half percent interest kind of thing. I mean, if, gas, if oil is trading at zero dollars a barrel, it would be, I, it's easy to envision a 2% mortgage rate. Yeah. Right? 
So everybody that's got mortgages today uh, is going to want to refinance. I mean, it just, I just don't, it begins to see a, a point where people who want to buy, if they've been in a forbearance agreement, they're not going to be able to refinance because they've been in a forbearance agreement. So they're stuck. Mm -hmm. People who want to refinance and can, and, and can qualify for the lower mortgages, uh, the servicers could see that coming today. So between now and then, they're going to be really reluctant to write loans because if the servicer doesn't keep the loan on the books for six months of continuous payments, they don't get to resell the loan and it gets stuck on their line of credit. So they're going to own it. So without getting too much in the weeds, I just see this enormous demand for housing. I think people want to own a house. And I just see this real difficulty in being able to determine what the market is because of the range of inventory that's going to be available or not sold as the case may be uh, in October, September, October, November, and December. But am I making, am I rambling too much? Not at all. Um, I, I'm, you mentioned that you're recording this call. I'm, I'm debating whether or not, so do we open up the conversation to a wider monetary discussion? <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> so the Fed's balance sheet going to six, Six trillion. I think it's certainly conceivable that it goes to uh, you know upwards of 10, 12, 15 trillion. At some point, we have a confidence discussion, and uh, the, the geopolitical and the global implications of that. Right. So there are those that are that are that are suggesting that you know stuff's been going on since September in the bond market, and the Fed's been coming in with massive amounts of money there, and the bond market dwarfs the equities markets. Right. So. And the housing market dwarfs both of them. And the housing market dwarfs both of them, right? So, so, but, so what I'm looking at is we've got a multi-pronged, multi-faceted issue that is far larger than 08. It makes 08 look like like a blip on the radar screen. And I agree with that 100. percent If they can't, if they can't fix the bond and they in, in the housing, they didn't they didn't get the four minutes thing figured out in 08. Right? So if, to your point, they they don't figure it out this time, and we have the bond thing that. They're continuing to put, you know, it's like it's like they're trying to start a heart, but the, but there's no blood to pump. Um, so, how does that shake at the end of it? I mean, are we talking about uh, the U.S. dollar becoming something else? You know, that the, there's some of those types of discussions. Because the, whole, the, the whole thing about debt is about how you honor debt, right? Okay. And without getting into too much history, it used to be not too long ago that credit scoring did not exist. Okay. And the reason was that people would extend credit and they would work with you to be sure that you paid them first, right? So customer service was a lot nicer because you wanted to shop where people treated you nice and you wanted to pay, pay those people, right? And if people treated you like jerks and you had a credit line with them, you'd be slow pay on your credit cards. And so all these department stores had credit. And it would, I don't want to oversimplify this point, but it's going to get to be pretty much right now, people expect you to pay, right? You could see a situation in which it would be easy for the United States to uh, disallow all debt owned by the Chinese government. Okay. You know, so ever how many trillion that might be, but they could certainly say we're going to pay you one percent interest on the money, mm -hmm. whatever the interest rate we the bonds may have held. They now hold one percent interest. And if the Chinese dumps them, I'm, I'm sorry. And if the Chinese dumps them because they no well, longer want to trade, who's the buyer? Why would the why, first off the Chinese got to, if they're going to dump them, we still have battleships uh, and aircraft carrier, right? So there's nobody going to declare war on the United States. If if you're going to get something, Not just like in all debt collection situations, you 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 have made your borrower extremely unhappy. You have done things that you shouldn't have done as. Uh, uh, a, a member of the of the trade, let's say. Okay. China's got to have trade. If China doesn't have trade, its economy fails faster than any other economy in the world. I agree. So China's got to have trade. They've got to do business. They could easily save face by accepting an agreement to only take 1% uh, interest on their money and defer any principal payments for uh, 30 years. Some... I'm just making all that up, but all those kind of structures are available, right? And it gets to be a situation where the amount of money that's owed 
is only important if you can't make the payments. And if you can restructure the debt where you can afford to make the payments and everybody's willing to continue to accept the currency, there wouldn't be any reason not to. So the, I, I, I just see bigger structural issues. I mean, I'm not worried about the global issues. I'm worried about the structural issues inside the country, Jason. I'm worried about why do we need new school buildings? I mean, seriously, we've learned in the last six weeks that the reason 30% of all the children who go to school go to school is so that they can have two hot meals a day. Mm-hmm. And another, that 30% plus another 10 or 15%, up to 45% of all the kids are there. The children are there for a daycare. So their parents can go to work. Yep. And that's completely been changed, right? It's like how much more involved parents are in the education of their children in the last 45 days than they were in the previous two or three years combined. I think those, those that are responsible are stepping up to the plate. There's some neglect that's probably not showing its face yet. Um, Oh, a lot. There's a, there's a lot, right? Uh, they, they had this whole thing about, um, I think it was at Harvard, it was online classes, and people are seeing the inside of the places that their fellow students live. And the students were commenting on the range of places that they had no idea some of their fellow students lived in, right? Okay. So if you can notice inequality at a Harvard lecture, and I think this is Harvard. I think it was Harvard. But we're going to we're beginning to see people in a completely different light in the way in which education goes forward. And like this. So we're doing a Zoom meeting. I've never done a Zoom meeting before. You're my second test case. Thank you for being a test case. Yeah. But but we're, we're having this conversation. Right. Yeah. So I can see a situation very simply going forward where. Uh, there will be so much more business done with Zoom calls than have ever been done you know, normal meet for a coffee kind of thing. So, I, and every day the technology gets better. Every day the video, the cameras get better. Uh, the the security of the different platform gets better. Every day Zoom comes out with a new upgrade. But Skype has, you know, really raised its game. So there's so many platforms now. I'm waiting on them to come out with virtual curtains so I can fix my color contrast here. (laughs) (laughs) uh, uh, Like Khan Academy, say, right? Yeah. Uh, It's been around for a while. So a lot of this online learning stuff has been out uh, for a few years now. I think that it's, uh, personally, I feel like it's more an awareness thing than anything else, but the innovation has been there. And so we're we're just now utilizing it in a much greater capacity than we have. I mean, you've heard about, I'm sure you've heard about how Zoom's servers have been overwhelmed and the, and the demand they're trying right. to keep, keep, you know, cut, cut current with. Uh, so I, I think, and then there's like human nature that plays in, right? So to what degree do people change that, you know, pe- change typically doesn't happen until they're uncomfortable enough with the status quo to make the change. So do we revert back out of habit or is this, there's, is this a lasting thing? And I think what I'm hearing you say is that this is going to be incorporated in the future much more so than it had been in the past. And I agree with the gen, the, the generic side of that statement, but I, I can't, I can't see a scenario where kids aren't going back. Our schools aren't filled, uh, you know, come, I don't know, come August next year. So let's say that they are, and I'm all for schools. Don't misunderstand. I'm all for schools. But why build more schools, right? Why spend $50 million on these uh, school buildings, 20-year bond issues that the community is committed to, Mm -hmm. when 40% of the kids are there for daycare and food? Uh, So, so, I mean, we have to begin. Conversation our politicians can begin to have to influence that budget. Yeah, so so here's a little trivia. The Knoxville City Council meets tonight, two weeks ago. So this is their third Zoom meeting at the City Council. And you get to be up close and personal to the council people, much more so than when they're sitting on the dais uh, uh, speaking uh, and you're seeing them on CTV or it, even if you're in the auditorium, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You get to see their body language. You get to see them react. And, you got, and so you can see the city council people were completely lost on several items that were on the last uh, agenda. Okay. Uh, I mean, 
issues that involved hundreds of millions of dollars in real estate, zoning issues, classification issues, the mayor admitted she did not know what they were talking about. Now, when you, but one of the issues that came up was the zoo. And the zoo needs, as it turns out, $200,000 a week about just to feed the animals and to maintain uh, the property. The zoo's closed. There's no money coming in. They're going to, uh, the city made an, an emergency $700,000 loan to the zoo to be sure that they had enough money to make it through the end of June. But beginning in July, I don't think the zoo's going to even be close to generating, I, I mean, my grandkids aren't going to go to the zoo. To be in a crowd of people uh, and strangers, um, they certainly won't be going with me, right? Because Beth won't let them. <laughs> Beth is going to make sure that we're not doing that, right? I might do it, but she's going to make sure I don't, <laughs> right? So the city is going to have to have $200,000 a week available beginning the 1st of July just to maintain the zoo. I mean, if you begin to think in terms of all of the other facets that the city is not collecting money on, that the city is going to need to begin to pay everything about the way government works. Mm -hmm. So, and the reason that I'm saying that, why look the people who are, you know, the frontline people, the, the grocery store clerks, you begin uh, the um, people who are picking up the garbage, people who are doing their job every single day. The police, the fire, the nurses, those are people who signed up to put themselves in dangerous situations, quite seriously. They may not have wanted to be in the dangerous situation 24 hours a day while they're at work, but, they're, but they made the choice to be in a dangerous situation. The people who are working on a grocery store line never made that decision. The people who are collecting garbage never made the choice that they're going to be handling contaminated materials. So how do we pay those people going forward? I mean, we're going to have to begin to rethink, you know, they're having this thing about uh, baseball. No, nope, they're going to play the baseball games. Nobody's going to be there. Mm -hmm. Well, you might have more people watching. What does that do to baseball stadiums? Why do we have to have, why do cities have to pay billions of dollars to have a new football stadium? So, I mean, it, we're going to, society is going to have to begin to rethink the way people get paid, Jason. This is what I'm, this is what I'm talking about, a complete restructuring uh, of how mortgages are done. Um, I think people want to own a house, but there's, if you make less than $70,000 a year, there's a, I can't see any benefit to owning a house. You, you better have, you're better off having a three-year lease because then you've got the flexibility to move and you know what your losses are if you have to leave. If you own a house, you don't know what your losses are going to be if you have to leave. Mm -hmm. Right there, what you're talking about is more logic than the average person puts into the, uh, that consideration. Would you agree? <laughs> I think that was a compliment. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> It, it is, but also I think a reality of the lack of, uh, you know, financial stewardship or responsibility that goes into the typical decision, you know. Uh, Everybody wants to, I'm going to do a long video on, you know, the, 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 great, the greatest con of all time, the National Association of Realtors partnering up with the Roosevelt administration to create the housing industry. And the whole idea of everyone owning a home uh, mm -hmm. was a, effectively a employment, a local employment plan uh, that put people back to work six months at a time building a house. And the whole, I, bef before 1936, 44%, the largest ownership in, uh, in the history of the country had been 44% home ownership. It had generally run around 40% home ownership. 60% of the country was renters. In the 20s, 60, 70% were renters. It was unbelievable. Hmm. Uh, 
And so this whole idea that's been sold to people about owning a home is exactly that. It's been sold to people by the people who get paid to sell houses. And the idea of owning a house with a 30 year mortgage that you're going to live in for six or seven years, unless you're just really fortunate, historically, that's the, the amount of time that people would tend to turn a home. So I've made this comment several times. If you met people who had lived during the depression, they were in their late twenties, their thirties, early forties during the depression, Jason, the rest of their life, they never had enough money. My grandfather. Yeah. yeah right. They, they never took any risk. They did buy a home because they wanted the certainty of owning something that they could not lose. The government programs that allowed them to buy a home did not exist during the depression. So the government programs were put in place. They were given the ability to buy a home and they never moved. They paid that house off. They lived there. They saved their money. And generally they were not members of the consumer society. If, we, if this COVID-19 goes on for uh, an extended period of time, and I, I think I've said many times, my goal is to be standing July the 1st. But if we have a tepid recovery in the summer and we have a second wave that comes by back in the fall, we're going to have a generation of people that will never have enough cash. And the investor market for real estate will change forever. If the government stops funding loans, which is the direct fall off, if you start having mortgage defaults again, and the government gets out of the mortgage market, we, it's going to be, we're going to go back to being a rental society, which there's no, that's, a, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a reshaping of the way people are going to have to think about what their jobs are, why they have those jobs, why they get paid what they get paid. I mean, uh, what I'm telling people is not to be in a hurry to buy today because we don't know what the landscape is going to look like in 60 or 90 days. We don't know what the government programs are going to be. We don't know what the medicine's going to be. So right now, today, it's, it's a time to manage your cash, manage your tenants if you have tenants, help them get through some really tough times, help your tenants move forward with their lives. But, but going forward, this demand for housing is going to be extreme. Single family detached housing, whether it's ownership or rental, is the only product that really is the real clear winner out of this COVID nightmare. Do, do I sound too uh, dark about that? Uh, no, I don't, I don't tend not to look at things as bright or dark. I think it's accurate. Um, yeah, I, I really am uh, looking at the, so just, just zone. So one of the big changes, and I know you got to jump off the call, so I'll end on this. My call actually pushed 30 minutes, so I have more time. Oh, well, quick story. None, well, none of my stories are quick. So a story. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I've done the presentation many times um, on um, the five myths of real estate investing. And the first, and you've heard it several times, but the, you know, the first is uh, comps are dangerous and probably worthless for real estate investors. And nothing's proven that more accurate than uh, the coronavirus. But the fifth one is the big why, the passion that you need to have. And I've always talked about why that's just so wrong. Because, you know, that makes you, that's a touchy feely emotion. It gives you, it makes you feel good about why you're doing something, right? The real motivation, the only one that really works and the one that's been proven with COVID-19 is fear. It is, fear is the one motivation that will drive us to do things that we never, ever thought we could do. And so people are staying in because they're fear, they're, they have a certain fear of danger to themselves or to their loved ones. And the people who are beginning to not fear that are the ones who are getting out and protesting that they want to be able to get back out and go back to work. 
the this and so what happens is in 1963 in the late 50s early 60s the one thing that everybody in the united states was afraid of was russia and the ussr and satellite program and the papers every day were all the time talking about Russia, U, USSR, getting involved in satellite programs where they could drop bombs on America from space. And so the whole idea of putting people into space was the fear of someone else controlling what could happen to the United States. That fear was overpowering in this country. It became so powerful that when Kennedy gave his speech, the greatest goal speech of all time, was, we're going to send a man to the moon and bring him back alive by the end of the decade. 48 hours before he gave the speech, he was going to send a man to the Mars. And he got talked out of that because nobody had ever successfully launched a rocket in the United States. They didn't know what kind of rocket it was going to take to get there. Excuse me one second. So to end this long story about the fear that was going on then, they built a, um, the space launch, the space, the space assembly building. So he gives the speech, the building had not been started. They built the largest building on earth at the time to assemble. So think about this. They, the building does not exist. The plans do not exist. He gives the speech 21 months later, the largest building on earth had been built in the coastal plains of Florida. They built a building uh, that had to assemble rockets that had not been designed to carry payloads that had not been designed on a mission that nobody knew how much it was going to cost and if it was possible to do. And they built the building in 21 months in an environmentally sensitive coastal plain of Florida. There was no OSHA. There was no EPA, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got all these people now that want all this medical, these pharmaceutical plants to be relocated from China. But how much fear do people really have that we're going to be able to get along with China in the future? If these manufacturing plants really start coming back to the United States, and I mean really start coming back, 3,000, 5,000, 7,000 employee kind of plants, mm -hmm. and they need 50 acres, 80 acres, 100 acres, will the neighbors be able to stop them from getting built or will the fear factor say we have to be in control of our own destiny we want those factories here we're going to not abide by the epa will will people be able to they've, they've checked they've ripped up thousands of pages of fda regulations i could see them ripping up thousands of pages of epa regulations to be able to get these factories rebuilt in America. Okay. Is that too much of a ramble? No, I can, I, I, I don't think, I, I can buy that. Um, I, I sometimes check in, like, like I do with you, with a, a guy that's also a fellow investor, and he, he also runs a medical device company, and they, they import goods out of China. And so he's tapped into Chinese manufacturing, and, his take is that uh, there will be some that comes back uh, to our shores, but um, once we're on the uh, completely on the other side of this thing, uh, people tend to forget about things being American made whenever a mask costs two dollars when they can acquire one for thirty cents. So his, his acquire that it will his his perceptive perceptions that it'll come back, but it'll come back for the interim, and then. And then the, the, the cheaper, the less expensive cost will win out. Or so won't. let's follow up on that right there. They okay. moved to China because of no EPA regulations, no OSHA regulations, right? Okay. The cost of construction was 
minuscule compared to the cost of meeting the requirements in America. Sure. Right? The Ford, all, all of the auto plants that were built in America, the steel mills that were built in America, they didn't, I mean, they employed tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people over the years, right? Um, and we produced the cheapest cars, the cheapest steel, the cheapest everything. It's only when the government regulation began intervening and making things more difficult to build in America. So I'm not saying that those are good things or bad things. Government regulations are good or bad. But the reality is, if you start getting rid of the government regulations that force the, the expense of construction up, force the cost of employees up, um, all of a sudden what you're getting made in China for 30 cents might be able to be made in America at a dollar. And, at, and at, at that difference, Americans will buy it. I see. Okay. That's an interesting take. I hadn't considered that. The regulatory burden. Uh, the, they're showing all these videos, uh, Jason, all these pictures taken from NASA of the lack of air pollution along the East Coast. Uh, in the last uh, 30 days because people aren't driving, right? And so you can really see that this planet can very quickly heal itself if it's given just a little bit of a breather over time. So the, the question gets to be how much, if, if we bring things out of China, it slows the Chinese economy, it strengthens the American economy, it certainly creates a situation for everybody in America who wants a job to have a job. It might require some relocation of people, right? Yep. Uh, but the, the whole thought process is, I mean, we're going to have to be, really begin to think about from I, 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 one of the videos I've got on YouTube, the uh, winners and losers. Uh, and you, but you begin to think in terms of where will these new factories be built? Can they be built? If they're built, how do they begin to change the travel patterns of entire communities? Uh, and it really, I mean, like Tennessee's got that super site out in uh, that 10, 12,000 acre super site out in West Tennessee. Well, they could certainly bring in three, four, five, six manufacturing plants, and it would change the entire dynamic of everything in West Tennessee.